Hi, welcome back to Rust 101. This is video 19. Uh, we're talking today about how to create a nice API. So if you're writing a library, how to make it easy to use and consistent and good to use for people who are writing code based on your code. Uh, this is another uh, lower intensity video from the, the kind of deep ones about traits and things like that. Um, don't worry, there are more high intensity things coming up. I had a look ahead at some of the slides ahead. Uh, there's loads of stuff about parallelism and um, uh, like serialization and like there's some really hardcore stuff coming. Um, this is just a uh, slightly lighter one to keep you going. How to create a nice API. Okay, so um, I guess the short answer is have a look at this checklist that's provided by the Rust project that just gives you all the things you should think about when you're writing a library to try and make your library consistent with other things and follow... Um, <clears throat> recommendations um, that people in the Rust project have found helpful. So I guess um, this checklist would be uh, almost mandatory for stuff that's in the standard library um, and very much preferable if you're writing a library that you want other people to use and enjoy using. And you can see some examples of the kinds of stuff that are in it about things about naming, interoperability, and actually I've got it here. So let's look a bit more through it. So, you know, there's recommendations about what case you should use for your uh, uppercase, lowercase uh, names and things like that. Um, we'll look at, in a second, at some of these conventions, all kinds of stuff like that, making it interoperable with other code, uh, recommendations around macros, how to document your stuff, uh, making your stuff predictable, flexible, uh, making sure you make use of the type system in the best possible way, um, all kinds of stuff. We'll also talk about licenses. So... Um, have a short answer have a look at the checklist which is linked uh, below and linked in the exercises link as well um, and that will get you quite a long way but in order to use that checklist you need to understand the principles behind it and the stuff in it so let's have a quick think about um, what is recommended by the rust project to make your code re easily reusable by other people so they they split it up in three ways which i think are really good ways of thinking about this um, you should try and make your API unsurprising. And I actually think any code you're writing, even if you're not writing a library for someone else, even if this is just a part of your um, project that you're going to be using kind of as a library. You know, so any function, really, or any struct or whatever that you're writing, um, try and follow these principles. Try and make it unsurprising. And we'll talk about what that means. Try and make it flexible. And we'll talk about what that means. And try and make it obvious. Like, I guess, obvious how to use. Um, okay, so... Let's start with how do you make your API unsurprising? What, do, what does it really mean when we say that? Well, first thing to say is let's uh, try and use naming. Obviously, like naming is hard. It's one of the things about programming, right? Um, so let's try and kind of build on uh, the naming setup that other people have used so that we're consistent with other, um, other code that people are already using. So let's try and follow conventions that are used in, in code that you've used. So as you get more familiar with Rust, you'll get better at doing this. But here are some um, immediate hit, hints. If you're, if you're writing a getter, something that like just returns the value, the value of something inside you, um, in Rust, we don't call it get something. We just call it the name of the thing. So that could be, uh, I don't know, color or something like that. It wouldn't be get color, it would just be color. Um, and if you want to get hold of a mutable reference to a thing, then you call it the name of the thing and then underscore mute. And that's just, you might you might or might not like that, um, but that's the way uh, we do things in Rust. So good to be consistent. Um, and then also there are meanings to these prefixes. So as means um, get me a, like a reference to this thing, but with a different type, or reference to the stuff inside this thing or something like that. Uh, two means get me a copy of this thing, but convert it to a different type. And into means uh, take ownership of my thing, like delete my thing and replace it with a thing of this type. So yeah, as it says, the, the naming there depends on how much it costs you at runtime and how whether the thing you're returning is owned or borrowed. So as means borrowed, to means get me a copy, and into means um, delete the thing you're calling the method on and give me a transformed version that I own. Okay, um, other things that you can do to make your library unsurprising. Um, make sure that 
if you're so this is not true for just uh, i would say this is not true for just code you're writing that's part of your project if 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 you're writing code that's part of your project then you should only add the kind of derive blah stuff on your struct or your enum if you need it i think i would recommend that although i'm not 100 percent sure on it but if you're writing a library where other people are using your code they they may very well need this stuff on their types and if you don't provide it on your types then they can't have it. They have to write extra code to make it work. So, um, for example, uh, if if it if it unless it completely doesn't make sense for your thing to be clonable, um, then you should derive clone. Um, you, you should think hard about copy because copy is kind of a, quite a special thing that means your your thing is very cheap um, and small. Um, but yeah, if it makes sense for your thing to be comparable with another thing. Then, then derive partially and eek. If it makes sense for your thing to have a, some kind of ordering, um, then derive partial order and order. By the way, I would say only do that if it's obvious what that would mean, right? If you have, if there are multiple things inside your struct and it's not clear whether you should be ordering them by one or the other or both, then I would not recommend implementing partial or deriving partial order unless there's some obvious, uh, sensible way to compare them and you document it um, but yeah you might uh, you might well also people using your thing might need to be able to, be able to hash their thing so why not derive hash uh, they definitely are going to want to print that thing out for debugging so derive debug quite often they're going to want to print it out for non-debugging so if if it makes sense um, to provide a, a default language uh, text form of your thing then derive display um they, it's incredibly helpful if there is like a sensible default value for your thing, like a kind of empty version of it or um, nothing's happened yet version of it, then uh, derive default. Um, and the, uh, if you don't derive serialize and deserialize and someone has a struct that has your thing inside it and they want to serialize and deserialize it, they have to do hard work to um, make their thing serializable and deserializable um, so seriously consider um, implementing uh, like deriving these traits on your thing so that your thing will just automatically be okay to transform into JSON or XML or whatever they need um, by the way isn't it interesting all these things are in the standard library apart from these two these 30 things maybe 30 should be in the standard library huh uh, anyway, th basically, uh, try and derive loads of stuff if your code is going to be part of a library that other people use. Okay, uh, now how about making your API, that was about making your API unsurprising, how about making your API flexible? What do we mean by that? Uh, well, we mean like people can use it in ways that you haven't necessarily anticipated. So obviously, predicting the future is hard, but here's some ways that people have found that makes your code uh, easier to reuse in ways you hadn't thought of so for example think about now obviously you can go too far with this but think about when you're writing a function that does something for example this function adds up two things i find this example a little bit um less than the most useful because it, it it's called add and all it does is add and like you've already got the ability to add things but anyway imagine that this does something cleverer uh, and we've written some code for the example we were writing it for we wanted to add up to u32s and return a u32 um, but uh, that's quite limiting for anyone using it. If they have U16s or um, they have some other type they've written, which has a plus operator, um, then they can't use our add function if it's written like this. So consider, now this adds a lot of complexity, so only consider it, but consider writing your function, I mean, not with the word generic literally in its name, right, but, but just... Right. This is just like this would probably still just be called add, or <sighs> it would be a different example that doesn't just add things up. Um, but yeah, make it generic. And the, what they've done is they've made it generic over the return type O. Um, and then they've said there's another, there's the type T, which is the two, the type of the two incoming things. And they've said that T um, is of type add with an output of O. And that means basically. When you add them up, you get, when you add up two Ts, you get an O. So this still works, right? So um, if you write your code like this, now there is a complexity cost to it, and you need to, I don't know, will you need to write twice as many unit tests or a million times as many unit tests in order to check it with different types? Um, you know, I would want to do it with at least two different types just to make sure that I'd really 
successfully um, made it generic. And uh, obviously, it makes your code harder to read, but it means that your code is way more flexible for someone using it. So I would say use this with caution, right? If everything you write is like super generic, it's very hard to understand. It's hard for you to code, hard, harder for you to test. Um, you, you could go too far with this, but um, you're also missing out on the opportunity for people to use your code if you write it in a very restricted way that just is on a, uh, based on a single type. Um, what else? Okay, so another way to make your API flexible um, is not to make the decision for someone else whether um, they need to own the things they're passing into it. So if you if you take ownership of your arguments, that means the person calling you needed to own the thing in the first place. Whereas if you don't take ownership of your arguments, you just take a reference, then someone who's calling that code could either own the thing or not own the thing, and they can still use your function. So here's their example. Um, you've got a struct which contains uh, like 4,096 bytes. Um, and if you write your function manipulate large struct to take in a large struct, then they must own this thing when they call it. Whereas if you take make it take a reference and then do some stuff with it, even a mutable reference, right? Then it, then the person calling this doesn't have to own that thing to use it. But they, they could if they do own it, they still can use it. So it's more flexible. Um, uh, plus, plus, this may actually be expensive as well, right? So it, uh, th this is named large struct. So in this case, if you're passing in a large struct and then returning some different large struct, that may, depending on like compiler optimizations and stuff, um, be quite expensive. Whereas here we're like explicitly saying um, we're just modifying this thing in memory. Now I feel a bit cautious about that because um, there are some nice, really nice properties of like taking something and returning another thing um, that are like make it more flexible than just saying you must modify this one thing. But if you know this thing is going to be large, and here we do because we know exactly the type of it, um, then we know that it's sensible to um, just manipulate the one thing in memory and not not make a new thing. So this would be a good idea. So yeah, accept borrowed data if possible. Um, be where that is mutable data and you're modifying the thing, have some caution about that. But certainly in the case of large structs, um, it seems a good idea. Okay, so we talked about making your API unsurprising, and we talked about making your API flexible. Now the other principle that uh, they have is make your API obvious. Uh, and essentially that means make it easy for people to know how to use it. So first, uh, ex uh, first imp really important thing, make use of the really excellent documentation system that Rust has. So to write um, a comment which gets used as documentation instead of just a comment in the code, you write three slashes, you describe what this struct is for, or what, it, what it kind of is, you can provide Rust code by using backticks. This is markdown syntax. So it's markdown kind of inside this um, triple slash world. Um, you can you can your examples can have like extra code that doesn't get displayed in documentation by using this hash. By the way, use that sparingly because it can make your documentation con really confusing because there's stuff missing that is actually needed to make it compile. But the reason why you might want hidden lines is because this code is actually going to get checked by the compiler and actually uh, can get run as tests. Um, so not just checking that this code compiles, which is so useful. How many times have you um, thought, oh, I'll write some documentation with an example, but as soon as I write it, it's going to become, it's going to stop compiling and it's going to be worse than useless. Well, if you write documentation like this in Rust, as part of a standard compile, it will check not only that your um, documentation examples compile, but also that they any assertions in them pass. So you can write... Um, you can write little kind of tests as part of the documentation and they get tested. Downside of that is it can get slow. Running those tests can be slow, so you might want to skip them sometimes if you've got a lot of them. But, oh, boy, is it good to know that your documentation is actually still correct. And if you change something about your uh, your struct, then the compiler will tell you. So make use of this. Write lots of um, comments explaining what functions do, what structs are for, um, like, don't explain the stuff that the compiler already enforces. Um, explain the stuff about why you would use this 
uh, and, and then give examples of how you would use it. And people using your thing are going to be so grateful. By the way, nine times out of ten, I'm sure you do the same thing. When I look at this documentation, if there's an example, I jump straight to the example and I just re use that. So examples, that is, an, that is both a demonstration of how important examples are but it's also like a cautionary tale for you. Um, if you write some text and some examples, people are going to skip your text and just read your examples. So make your examples, explain stuff well, and if you have got words that you need to say, uh, make it short and sweet. Uh, what we're seeing on the right-hand side here is how this documentation comes out when you render it um, in the browser. You can just do cargo doc or cargo doc minus minus open to actually open your browser on your documentation, and then you get this lovely, completely um, not needing any internet documentation open in your browser with searching and all kinds of stuff, and your classes, your newly documented classes, um, start, things, functions, methods, whatever, um, or are all implemented and look nice just like all the other uh, Rust documentation that you're used to navigating, and CargoDoc will open up your documentation sitting right next to all that other um, nice documentation. So it makes you feel really grown up, like you're doing proper stuff. Okay, yeah, as I said, in, include examples, and then when you run the examples... Uh, oh no, sorry, this is different. So, as well as including examples in your documentation, um, also make use of this um, uh, feature of Cargo, which is that if you have an examples directory in your project, and you write some like programs with main methods um, inside that examples directory, then you can run examples like this, and then we'll compile and run. So make make use of that feature as well, that you can write like complete examples of how to use your library um, with a main method that actually shows you how to get started and then use it and then tidy up or whatever it is. Um, yeah, make use of that. Write little programs that are, you know preferably fit on a screen, I would say. Um, certainly when I'm looking at people's examples, I, I, I always hope they'll fit on a screen so that I won't get too confused reading them. Um, but just show you how to do things like, oh, you know, how to set up using this database or how to set up without any database or, you know, whatever it is. You know, that's the reason why you might want multiple examples. Um, but yeah, um, make that examples directory, stick some code in there so people know how to use your thing. Okay, what else? Well, um, when people are trying to use your code, there are various mistakes that they might make and Rust provides some very powerful tools to prevent some types of mistakes. Uh, and essentially, the best tool in your toolkit, uh, and maybe documentation is even better, I don't know. But anyway, um, one of the best tools in your toolkit is the type system. I think it is better because it's actually enforced by the compiler. Um, so here's an example of a function called load page, which takes in a URL and then loads it and then returns returns that what it loaded as a string or something like that. doesn't matter what load page does. The point is, uh, it takes in a URL, and you, that's possible to use correctly, but it's also possible to use incorrectly. Here we're passing in a single Unicode character. Uh, that's not a correct URL. Um, so that's a way that load page can be used incorrectly, um, which is painful for your user. So instead of um, every function within your library taking in this string, and maybe it has to check it before it uses it, or maybe it just returns an error when it all goes wrong, um, what you can do instead is make a struct which represents the kind of, this is a valid URL. Um, and actually, there is one in the standard library, so you wouldn't actually write your own, but this is just an example of the kind of thing you might do. And then you make a new method for URL, and that's the place where you check um, whether this URL is okay or not. And then you panic if it's not. Now, you might not want to panic. You might want to return, say, a result of self or something so that people can um, deal with that error um, at runtime, whereas a panic would basically be saying, you wrote your code wrong, go back and write it better. But either way, um, allow someone to make a URL that's been checked that it's valid. By the way, the valid function here is obviously not a full implementation of um, how you check a URL. But yeah, um, make sure that once you've got hold of an instance of URL, you know that it's a, it's a valid URL, and therefore you can pass it around without needing to check that and all the functions within your library and all the functions in the interface of your library just take in a URL, and they know that that's a valid URL. Um, and that what valid means for your project might vary, right? So it might be that any valid URL is fine, or it might be that you only want HTTPS URLs, for example, in which case you'd need to check differently. Um, so the point is here, um, the, the, to some extent this kind of works the same as it did before in this example, 
like we'll still panic because this was a bad URL, which presumably load page would have done anyway. But the point is you separate out checking this stuff into a separate place, which means it's clearer to the person using your stuff why it's gone wrong. But also any of that checking code now doesn't live inside load page. It lives inside this special thing that's just for um, getting hold of the right stuff. Okay, so, uh, yeah, it makes your intent clear and um, it can help security. If you're really um, uh, clear about where where your validation happens, um, then you can. it's easier to make your code secure, although that is obviously separate and very, very involved topic. Uh, by the way, as I said, there is the URL crate in the standard library. No, no, not in the standard library, sorry. A w there is a widely used crate, not in the standard library, called URL, um, which is um, excellent, so don't don't write your own URL. But if you needed like HTTPS, HTTPS URL, then maybe you would need something that wraps the URL but also validates that it's the right type of URL or something like that. So even in cases where there's already existing code, don't be tempted to use something uh, that is just kind of convenient. Use something that actually matches your the, the validation you need. Um, this can be so useful for um, like modeling physical properties. You know, if you have um, a type called if you have a if you're in an awful situation where you need to deal with um, code that uses degrees and radians to measure angles, please, please, please do not pass around. Um, floating point numbers where the variable name is degrees or something like that, please make yourself um, a new type struct, as in a struct that just has one member inside it, called degrees. So uh, if there's a function that takes in degrees, you can never accidentally pass in radians because it'll be a compile error. And then you make a conversion function between them. You can make this lovely little language that makes it all really clear what you're doing at all times, and you can't make any mistakes. So yeah, use semantic typing, especially for things that have units. Um, you know, feet, inches, um, meters, kilometers, uh, uh, weights, times, angles, stuff like that. Um, use use the type system, and you will thank your your future self will thank past self, or won't your future self won't even notice that they were pre prevented from making awful um, uh, space shuttle destroying errors. Um, by a simple compiler error that took them seconds to fix. Okay, one last tip for anyone, anyone writing any Rust code, especially a library code, um, run Clippy all the time, make it part of your regular build cycle. Clippy just gives you loads of tips about um, uh, things that you can improve in your code. You'll probably learn quite a lot about Rust from it. You're like you'll learn new methods you've never heard of that make your code a little bit nicer. Uh, and use cargo format, which uh, formats your code in the stand in the standard rusty way, so no one ever has to have an argument again about how to format your code. Try, if you can, to have the absolute minimal config file for cargo format. Um, th there's a file called rustformat.toml where you can put settings for like how you your code formatting differs from the defaults. I personally do have to have one thing in there, which is that I like my lines to be 80 columns long, um, but I try not to have anything else in there so that I'm as close as possible to how everyone else sees their Rust code. Um, maybe I should remove that 80 column thing, but I, I love 80 columns wide, so what can you do? All right, so as I said, um, uh, a less demanding video for today. Next time we'll be talking about testing, and then um, then we'll do some exercises based on this stuff, which I think probably will be quite demanding. Um, then we'll be moving on to um, lots, lots more like deeper, um, harder parts of how to write r more kind of advanced Rust code. Hope you're enjoying. Leave a comment, uh, subscribe. Thanks for watching, and let me know what you'd like me to talk about in future. Cheers, bye.